Welcome to our podcast. Your next big project is you. And this is our version of a top 10 hit parade. I've been privileged to interview a number of folks, leaders, managers, coaches, uh, to really rewind their lives and their careers to talk about their journeys to success. So when you think about this and listen to some of these clips that we're sharing with you around living a life of significance, around living a life with no regrets, around living a life with abundance, with gratitude, with the quest to be your best, having perspective in your life, and ultimately to live your legacy, not just to leave it, but to live it right now. Enjoy this as you're thinking about the next five to 25 years of your life at some point as well. See you in our next podcast. And I know when you're dealing with people around this discussion of meaning, meaningful goals, and I, I know from doing my additional research and knowing you as well as I do, that so many people are talking about, you know, their estimated lifetime income and with, you know, what money they need to withdraw. But you, you take it on a different approach, not just in terms of money you need to withdraw, but where's the game plan relative to spending? Mm -hmm. it'd, be interesting, it'd be interesting to get your perspectives on that as well. Yeah, I, I love this topic, Leo. Our, our industry means well, and I, I think it's a wonderful industry. It really can make profound changes in people's lives if, if advice is delivered properly. But that said, I, I do feel that it's skewed a little bit towards save, 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 save. And, you know, and then everybody saves this big bundle of money. They don't have a lot of goals associated with it, but they work their whole life. They save this big pot of money. And then the number one fear is across the United States, um, and it, it's these surveys come out time and time again, the number one fear is I'm going to run out of money. Well, that's kind of awful. I mean, you spend your whole life saving, and then you retire, and your number one fear is running out of money. In fact, 60% of the people feared running out of money more than death, okay? So I, I liken that to all right, let's say you, you plan a, a, a trip across the United States and you want to do um, you want to see all the national parks. Right. So you get the kids in the car and you get this whole plan. You got your trip tick or whatever it might be. Maybe it's Google Maps today. But and you're you're going across the country on this wonderful, extravagant tour across the United States. And if all you're doing is obsessing over the, the gas gauge because you're just worried about running out of gas. And you're constantly looking down. Am I going to run out of gas? Am I going to run out of gas? It, it, you're you're not looking out the window at all the beauty. You're, you're you're missing out on all the opportunity that's right around you. And so I feel that a lot of the financial planning is so um, stressed around. Am I going to run out of money? And you know, is the market's going to come up and the market's going to go down? I like to spin it around a little bit and say, let's create a strategy around how to spend your money. Let's let's try to make this financial plan such that you de you deplete the money down to the point where you know you're you've got either little or nothing left or you've got whatever you want to bequest to your children that's fine but let's find a way to spend it and that really kind of gives people a little smirk and they're like oh yeah let, let's do that let's find it and so um, I like to put together that punch list of things like you know, kind of like the bucket list type of thing, I'll, I'll say, you know, and what, what are some things that we want to do that can uh, be experiential where you can spend time with people that you love and spend time doing more of what you love? We also talked about two golden rules. I know that you hold near and dear to your heart. It's about showing up, number one, and it's about this whole issue around communicating. Say more to why those really resonate with you. Yeah, well, you know, it's funny. It started with I don't know where they they came from, but it ended up being applied to um, uh, you know re recruiting potential employees. And I I said, uh, look, you want to come work here as a salesperson or as a real estate analyst or marketing? I said, this is what you you, you want to be successful, and um, and it's not about being the smart. It's not about being the whatever. I said, the first thing you got to do is you just got to show up. And that's not about attendance. That's not being, that was before work from home, right? It was just, you got to come here with your baseball glove and say, and your cleats, 
what position do you need me to play today? I'm ready. And uh, you may not want to play right field, but you know what? We need a right fielder. And uh, that's what's important uh, because you're not here for yourself. You're here for the team. And the team has a goal. And the only way we can make that goal, get that goal to be achieved is if you do your part for the team. And the communicate thing is really something that no one can do it themselves. It just doesn't work that way. And, uh, and I, and I, I, I took share this with my students. I said, because no matter how good you are, you just need people and you can't work with people, uh, or provide your work to people and get your ideas across unless you can communicate. So when you're stuck, raise your hand and say, look, I got six things to do and I can't do all of them. So if we got to get all six done or maybe seven, I need help. Right. Right. And saying that you were un, 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 unequipped or, or, or is not an acceptable answer uh, because if you didn't ask for help or the resources that you need and do it in an effective way, um, we all lose. And so th- th- those are the two rules. <laughs> What's been your philosophy as you work with clients on some of these training initiatives, changing attitudes, knowledge, mm-hmm. and skill? Philosophically, where do you come from on that? You know, you just said a mouthful right there. Um, the very first book that, that Rob Brinkerhoff and I wrote, High Impact Learning, really captures that philosophy. And it's really one of learning has to have an impact. It has to have an impact both on employee performance. And like you said, it doesn't matter what your job is, but if an organization is going to make an investment in learning, they need to get that investment back and improve performance, better, different performance. They're heading in another direction. Um, and secondarily, or, or, you know, in line with that, then the business needs to see that result in terms of increased sales, customer satisfaction, whatever the metric is. But in addition to that, that's, that's like, number one priority, number one philosophy. But just as important, it is our job as the designers of learnings, as the architect of a learning structure, that we create learning that employees want to take. Not Mm -hmm. that is mandatory, required. I have to take it. I have to check the box. A lot of, for example, a lot of compliance training is in that is in that realm of um, safety training. Got to do it every year, check the box. And that kind of training is typically wicked boring. It's horrible. And if it's, if it's e-learning, people hit the next button until they can get to the test and finish the test and get out, get out of there as quick as you can. So my philosophy has always been to design learning that employees are engaged with, they want to take. And I think the way you do that is you create curiosity. You create you create this, this um, need for people to say, geez, I wonder, I wonder about that. I'm curious about that. I want to learn more about that. I mean, Leo, that's my favorite question. Any question that starts with the words, I wonder, I love that. And I, I feel like that's my goal. Hey, what's this uh, concept of the, of the mixtape? I was on your website doing some <laughs> research before I called you as well. And I saw this. You talking on stage around the mixtape. Yeah. Uh, I was going back to my uh, brother, uh, rest in peace, who made me this mixtape growing up. Absolutely. And I had all my special songs and he knew it. Remember you said the cassettes and I played yeah. the cassette with my mixtape. And I think when I got married, my wife and I had our mixtape when we were traveling sure. and stuff. What, what, what's just, your spin on this? It's just a way of telling people how old we are, Leo. That's all that <laughs> is. Yeah. yeah. No, this was, I mean, the mixed, it was, it was just a story I was, I was telling. Um, and it was a bit of a cautionary tale, if you will. And it, it just kind of went back to a, an experience I had with my son, who's, you know, at the time was about seven or something. I mean, he's the ripe old age of 12 now, but, um, in, in a song had come on, it was at a James and, and in the radio and we, you know, we were singing and, and I said, oh gosh, you know, dad put this on a mixtape for me when we met and he, just had no idea what a mixtape was. And I thought that was like the greatest gap in his education that I had ever come across. So, you know, I'm getting home and I'm looking for my Walkman 
And I was like, I want him to experience the whole thing. But that as I, you know, as I sat back, because he thought, you know, why not Spotify? Wouldn't wouldn't you just go there? Uh, and he was right, it turns out. <laughs> but, the, the, you know, the whole point, I think, is I thought about it related to client experiences that we, you know, my goal in that case was just to share a piece of music with him. How I experienced that and how he experienced it, they're very different. But I could have achieved that goal if I just leaned into the way he thinks and learns and experiences things rather than having to dig through my basement for Walkman. Um, and and so what I think that happens with client experience, especially as we think about next gen, right? We we know what we want to accomplish. We know what we want clients to feel and to experience. But I think we have to be hyper cautious that we're not layering our own filters on it of how we experienced it or what we expect. And I look, I have heard many advisors say, my clients don't want this or I didn't expect, I don't like that. Well, that may be true, but you've, you've really got to find out and, and things are changing, right? I think we just have to lean into that change and embrace it. Um, yeah. The mixtape like, place, but it's like you can have a mixtape for every client, right? I mean, in terms of their, like you said, every client is different. Everybody's <laughs> got their own fingerprint, their own DNA. A process yeah. need to be personalized and customized as much as possible. You can have an optimal way of helping someone achieve their wealth goals, but the sensitivity of realizing that everyone's unique needs to be really taken uh, taken into consideration. Yeah. What are the typical? Elements of real value that personal coach attends to. Art, do you want to start or would you like me to? No, that, that's fine. Uh, so so I think it comes back again to this time freedom, money freedom. Uh, you know, I mean, the, the ultimate payoff. The, listen, the financial services business has changed dramatically over the last number of years. Uh, the regulatory environment, uh, the corporate environment, uh, the, the, the consumer environment. I mean, it's changed a heck of a lot. And, 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 uh, you know, the other thing about advisors, they're entrepreneurs, uh, many of them are, and, and they got a gazillion things that they could do. They got more opportunities and they have time to deal with them. And so, you know, we spend time with them side by side as partners trying to figure out, okay, what's the next step? What's the, what's the next, what, what's the thing you should be paying attention to instead of being all over the map? And then the ultimate payoff is, look, you got more time with your family, more time with, you know, to, to enjoy life. And you got the money to afford it. Um, those are, to me, are the two key, uh, key payoffs that I see. Yeah. Would you yeah. Take, Julie? Uh, I would definitely agree with with Art, but I would say, Leo, the measurement really depends on the situation. So, for instance, if we have someone who is looking at exiting the business and developing a succession plan, you know, we'll help them really develop. Uh, make sure that their their business is set up to be sold and that they have a life after business. They know what they're going to be doing and that they that business is a part of their life rather than life being a part of their business. Um, and so there's, uh, you know, we might uh, measure on, you know, the value of the business at the end of the day because we've helped them, you know, make their, their business uh, successful and to a point where it's much more valuable than it might have been when we started. Uh, we, uh, we might measure the tizzy factor. So I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, share a story in that I started working with, a, uh, an individual who was 65 years of age, had a very successful practice, but he had just had triple bypass surgery and was stressed to the nines and, uh, and, and really was very concerned about his life, let alone his business. And his clients and his family and uh, the people who worked for him. And so we sat down and really what we wanted to do was harness his health and uh, bring his stress levels down. And so when I met with Ernie for the first time, I said, Ernie, how are we going to measure success? I said, it seems like you're always in a tizzy. You're like you're just, you're just going in circles all the time and you just can't settle down. And he's, Julie, that's exactly right. I'm in a tizzy. And I said, okay, well, let's let's measure the tizzy factor. And he said, well, what's that? And I just made it up in a moment. And I said, okay, on a scale of zero to 10, you know, zero being really healthy stress and 10 being negative stress and you being in a tizzy, where are you today, Ernie? And he said, Julie, I'm a 14. Hmm. So wow. at, we just built uh, over time, we started to develop measuring, okay, Ernie, today, what's your tizzy factor? And we just 
worked on things that helped him simplify his business and focus on the right things and start to have more time freedom as art, you know, and he loved to go to the Bahamas and had this beautiful boat in the Bahamas. And so he and Jan started to take more time off and we built the structure in his business to allow him to do that and to feel like he was in more control of his financials. And there was somebody on his team to actually manage, manage the rest. And so we spoke probably three or four years later at a best practice, a seminar for advocates here in Toronto. And uh, I asked him on stage, Ernie, what's your tizzy factor today? And he said, Julie, it's a two. Wow. So there is that, to me, that is, that was more rewarding than some of, you know, some of the other successes we've had. Uh, but, but we just seen, you know, advisors grow as human beings, as leaders, as, um, you know, financial, have much more financial freedom. Um, they're spending more time with their children. They have better relationships. They, you know, they're connecting with the right clients. So they're more engaged and happy and, um, and as a result of focusing on the right things and the measurement of financials and, you know, focusing on sales and, and growth and doing the right thing for the client, we're seeing, we're seeing, we see extraordinary results and have lasting impact, uh, Leo. And so it's, uh, it's, it's just so rewarding, both monetarily for us, because, you know, we do charge a few for what we do, um, sure. yeah. but, but at the same time, it's, uh, there's so much psychic reward as well. And one of our questions here is under under becoming your best is like, what is, what is best you look like? You know, the gaps and opportunities from keeping you from being your best you. So that could be best Joe Corker. It could be when you're counseling people, as you said, the, I know you love being around young people and you've got kids as well. When I, when I talk about being your best you, how does that resonate with you? When either, either when you look in your own mirror or when you're guiding others, in a mentorship position as you, as you were involved in and try to help others proceed on a pathway to becoming better or their best version of themselves. How's that hit you, bud? Well, for me, I think it's around being focused on that individual and group people I'm working with and supporting and not necessarily putting in my biases or my interests, um, but looking for ways that I have had opportunities, the turning points the tipping points in my career where others have helped me, you know? Um, so first truly caring about their success and being curious about where they want to go, what they want to do. And it's a lot of the things that we do and working with our clients, but, you know, really understanding, you know, where their strengths are versus where their weaknesses are and help them navigate a road that you and I have traveled over the last 40, 50 years to be in a position to help others and to impact whatever industry organization or group that they're working with. And that's, that's kind of where, you know, I think I'm at my best where I'm curious, I'm interested, I'm committed to their success and I'm willing to donate my time and make it a priority. Um, so those are the things that make Joe Corbin yeah. his best when he is at his best. <laughs> Joe, you, you had me at a low, then you got me worried when you said the last 40 to 50 years. <laughs> because that's, that's bringing reality into our lives. Question I ask people, let me ask this to you when it says, what does the life of significance mean to you? And if you were, I'm just curious from all the great work you do on advisory boards, how does a question like this come into play uh, from what you're looking for from advisors? Because I would think they want advisors to help them to figure questions like this out, not just do I have enough money to live on? So, Steve, what does the life of significance mean to Steve Worshing? Let's go there, big guy. Well, I think, I think, well, so I'm a libertarian and a humanist. So, <laughs> for me, you know, uh, uh, you know, the libertarian in me says that, you know, we should be, we should be masters of our own domain and that, you know, we should be a, a society of people who work with each other and not rely on a big government to do stuff for us. And as a humanist, I believe that the high calling we can answer to is help our brothers and sisters out there. And that there, there, there's, you know, that it's it's other humans that that are the highest priority. So for me, a life of significance is being of service to others and and whether or not that work is to the extent to which I'm remembered for something, whatever it is that I'm, you know, that that, you know, 
that um, you know, if if I changed something for someone, or if I if I was able to work on a project that created opportunity for other people, to me that's significant. So, for example, I'm on a, on the board of a school of music and dance, and a big a big the the original part of its mission was they're going to provide high level instruction regardless of financial means. And so, if you're a kid in poverty, you deserve to explore this if you want to. And that's really meaningful to me because we know kids who take music lessons do better in math and they do better in English. And if they're playing an orchestra, they're not out on the streets getting into trouble. And, you know, it, it, there are all these great positives that come out of it that if I can contribute in some way to the success of that school, then I feel like I've helped other people go on to live better lives than they would have been exposed to themselves. So for me, significance is that, is that if you can be remembered for something in particular that you did to help other people. Tell us more about True Wealth and the goal of achieving return on life, please. Yeah, Leo, it, it really, you know, obviously we're in the numbers business and we know we're accountable to the numbers. Uh, we have to obviously drive a result, but the concept of True Wealth for me started over a decade ago and, and just from being around the business and, and hearing uh, people share deeply, intimately around uh, their life and uh, what they're trying to find, ultimately, this concept of true wealth is, is really around things that money can't buy and death can't take away. And it's, mm -hmm. it's things I think we're all striving for. You've reached security. You've reached, you've reached a level of stability in your life. And people are... are searching and digging and wanting more meaning around uh, their wealth, around time with family, around legacy, uh, making memories, you know, having experiences that are going to, to allow them to, you know, create that legacy ultimately. But, you know, we're just trying to bring meaning to the money differently and, and getting people to think much more broadly about their life's purpose at the end of the day. Yeah. I love that concept, Michael, of, uh, things that money can't buy and that death can't take away. Say a little bit more to that. That's a really interesting theme there. Yeah. You know, true wealth is, is the backbone of Bradley Wealth. I mean, anybody that knows our firm that's been associated with our firm for, you know, a decade, almost two decades now knows that this idea of true wealth is everywhere in our firm. You know, it's, it's out in social media. It's, it's, in our vocabulary, it's part of our DNA. But you know, working with you and part of the sabbatical experience and the, the incredible synergy from being your best, living your legacy around you know the seven principles, has evolved into our mission at Bradley Wealth, which is knowing your why and understanding the meaning of what you're trying to accomplish. And that's where return on life came about. We know we're responsible for driving return on investment. How often do we hear right. that? Everybody's about return on investment, you know, in our world. And yeah, we have to deliver, but getting people to think about what is your return on life? Uh, what does that mean? How are you attacking that? Um, you know, where do you, where do you go throughout your journey to find life's purpose. So right. true wealth, return on life. Um, as you know, life, building a life of significance, building a legacy is is what a lot of people are, are so desperately trying to achieve. Now you're living this life of significance, as we might say, uh, but you were living it before. It, this isn't something that just started for you now. I know you've been doing your best to make a difference in people's lives since I've known you, and I'm sure way, you know, way beyond in terms of when I was privileged to get to know you. You talk about significance and the shift as well to the continuation of relevance. Um, talk to me more about how you see those two words. Well, I, I learned um, back in uh, 2008 or nine, I was, uh, had an opportunity to take a, a different role that turned out to be really smart thing to do. And I talked to my good friend, Dick Lyons, who was the CFO of personal investing. And I said, well, what do you think? And he said, well, you know, so many people get caught up in, you know, what's my new title going to be and what's my you know, responsibility going to be and how, and everything else. And he goes, Andrew, the most important thing that you should take into consideration around a new opportunity is how relevant you're going to be to the organization. 
And there are lots of people that have chased the titles. And today you can't find them because they're really not that relevant to the business. And, uh, and, and you want to keep that thread close to, um, to ensure you're part of it. And, um, and, that, and that I always pass that on to folks because I always had high potential leaders and individuals on my teams that were always being approached from different parts of the business or even outside the business. And I, I said, how important is the relevancy of your job um, to the success of the organization? And how, how's that going to affect you if people ask, what do you do? And you have to explain what part of the company you're in or what or whatnot. So, um, and, I, and I felt my relevance also related to p- other people's success. And, you know, today, while I'm not getting all the, uh, you know, the lots of emails from, from my, my former company, I am getting calls and emails from co- former colleagues asking, Hey, you know, I have this opportunity or I'm one of two final candidates for this role. What do you suggest? And, uh, I get a lot of, um, that, 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 uh, motivates me a lot to be able to help and pass on, you know, 38 years of experience or pieces of it to people if they contemplate different opportunities. Because I mean, the growth of uh, uh, my former company is phenomenal right now. Job opportunities are abundant and you want to make sure that, you know, if you're doing a great job in, in a great part of the company today, if you leave it, make sure that you go to a great opportunity because you leave that opportunity once. So uh, I'm getting, you know, I'm kind of babbling here a little bit, but in my current state, you know, it's, uh, there's nothing really significant I'm doing. Um, I'm not that relevant to too many people's lives other than my family, my my daughter and son-in-laws and my grandsons and my son, spending, being able to spend more time with them than I ever have. Um, there are days where they don't think that that's great, but, <laughs> uh, you know, that's, that's more important to me in terms of relevance today and significance than anything else is... Um, it ha- make, I, I, I hate to say it, but it's almost like making up for lost time. 